So here in part two of the AM detector series, I want to uh, dispel any uh, rumors that we're going to be getting into DSPs and uh, algorithms and that kind of thing. I'm keeping it in the analog domain, okay? So we know that there's really three methods of analog demodulation, and I will cover those. Now, yes, this is the world of DSPs, this is the world of software-defined radios, and we have been there for some time. Actually, this receiver here that uh, I picked up, Surplus, is an example of early DSP receiver technology. Everything is analog until you get to the tuner and the back-end IF. So the last IF of this receiver is digitized. It allows you to go through all of these modes, AM, synchronous AM, FM, FSK, CW, lower sideband, upper sideband, independent sideband, and so on. It allows you to set your IF, set uh, anything you want, and it does all kinds of fancy scanning and switching and filtering and so on. This was designed in the late 70s, and it was available by the early 80s. So DSP technology goes back 40-some years, no problem. Now, did you see DSP technology 40 years ago? No, you didn't. This was strictly for the military and the surveillance uh, market, and uh, this was not something that hams would see until probably 20 years ago is when the DSP revolution really started with ham radio gear. And it would take longer to get to the nano VNA and those little dongles that are made out of the TV chips, all software-defined stuff. This is not that. We're gonna talk about AM in a very analog way. Let's, uh, let's get started. Now, my test fixture, there was a couple questions about my test fixture. This is nothing but a, uh, I guess originally it was a grid leak detector foundation, but it uses a coil that you would see on any typical crystal radio. It's a tapped coil every 20 turns, and it goes all the way out to 100 turns. So it's like 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 on the taps. And then it has a primary, of 20 turns center tapped. Very simple coil with a two inch diameter. So I'll be using this test fixture to test all of the AM detectors, starting of course with our favorite, the crystal radio or the crystal detector. And uh, we'll see how the crystal radio has a certain uh, amount of uh, emotion evolved with it. And uh, I'm gonna say that it goes beyond that. It actually goes to a passion Crystal radio construction, technology, improvements, it's a really big deal. You're gonna find probably hundreds of sites devoted to crystal radio contesting, crystal radio construction improvements, and so on. Starting with the kids' simplest crystal set, which is simply a razor blade with a needle and a pair of headphones uh, attached to uh, the ground the ground of your house, okay? All the way up to some pretty fancy crystal sets that use multiple ganged high Q tune circuits, fabulous transformers, fancy headphones, and elaborate antenna systems. And of course, we're gonna study the diodes and uh, we might do a little bit of biasing on the diodes just like we did for the tube type detector. So that's why this control is here. I can actually bias up the various types. I am gonna go through the crystal set stuff first. Then we're gonna go into bipolar. We'll get into FET type AM detectors. Even that is gonna take us through probably five or six different styles of detector. So stand by. This is part two, solid state AM detectors. So let's take a closer look at my test fixture. This test fixture allows me to set the switch in this position, which produces a simple crystal radio type setup with no bias at all. When I want to put bias in, I put the switch in this position, which connects this one and a half volt battery, putting voltage across a 100K potentiometer. That could be a 10K, 100K, 50K, whatever. And then off the center of the pot, we're going over to a capacitor to ground, and I have a 0.1, although it's marked 0.12, I must have measured it. And I think that's like a 2.2 or a 10 microfarad 
electrolytic across it. That establishes the ground. But we have DC on there, so there is a feed resistor that actually is coming off that pot that goes to this point, which is the bottom of the coil. So we're force feeding DC into the bottom of the coil, and of course it comes out this, the tap for the diode and goes through the diode, and then eventually finds its way to ground through the 10K load resistor. This is a 0.01 on the output. A very standard crystal radio type setup. There's 100 turns in the main coil, tapped every 20 turns, and we have the diode up on the first 20 turn tap. The primary coil is 20 turns center tapped. So pretty straightforward crystal radio with the ability to add bias up to 1.5 volts. Now that's fine for all of these silicon and germanium diodes and uh, shock keys, but it's not fine when you're trying to use something like a light emitting diode as a diode because the LED needs more voltage. So you'd probably need three volts to do the shock key. I used a six volt, volt pack, or you might have to fool around with the feed resistor to make it lower. I was able to bias all of the diodes with this setup, except for the LED, which needed a few more volts. So that's the uh, test fixture we're gonna be using to test these uh, various diodes to see how sensitive they are. So next we'll establish an input signal uh, with 30% modulation at 700 kilohertz, and that'll be our test signal. Looks like it's about 25 millivolts input total of RF. Let's look at the output of this crystal set. And it looks like we're getting around 18 millivolts out RMS. Let's make sure we're peaked up. Okay, let's introduce some bias. This is a uh, germanium diode. Turn on the bias, it went down. Let's start to bring it up. Again, this is 1.5 volts total. Let's start increasing it. That's about it. And we got out a little over 19. So someone observed that there wasn't much difference biasing a germanium diode. Absolutely correct. It's barely measurable. It's only about a millivolt and a half improvement RMS compared to unbiased with a good germanium diode. Yes, the bias does give improvement. Okay, I'm gonna take it out. But it's only a little over one or 1.5 millivolts of improvement. Let's try your old friend, the 1N914. 1N4148. With the 1N4148, we can see that we're barely turning the diode on at all, getting almost no output. If we measure this, it's down into the three millivolt RMS region. So let's introduce some bias. And again, this is the 1N914, 1N4148. Not bad. Yeah, I'd say it's uh, up around what we were getting with the germanium diode. So again, no bias on the 1N4148, 1N914. And with bias, it's doing as well as the germanium diode. Okay, here's a Schottky diode. This is a Schottky signal diode, the BAT85, BAT85 showing good sensitivity, excellent sensitivity, zero bias. This is an excellent diode. Now we're gonna put some bias in. I think we have a winner here. The 
Shaki diode with bias is actually beating the germanium diode for sensitivity. Next, I have a 1N4001 power diode. Not doing well at all. So we're going to introduce some bias to this 1N4001 rectifier diode. It's very unhappy. <laughs> this is a very unhappy diode. We are getting some rectification, but uh, the audio output is extremely low. Looks like we've got about four millivolts RMS coming out of detected audio. Let's try another power rectifier. An old fashioned top hat rectifier from the 60s. Let's try applying some bias. It's actually better than the one in 4001, but still very low output. These power rectifiers have a lot of capacitance, and that's what's going against you here. Probably the fast recovery shot keys, and especially the signal shot keys, will do a pretty good job. You can't expect power rectifier diodes to do a good job because of their capacitance. Here's another germanium diode. This is a 1N270. It's reading around 19 millivolts RMS out. Let's introduce bias. Now, I'm only getting about one millivolt improvement. Okay, bias without bias. Germanium diodes seem to be very good as is. The bias helps them, but it doesn't help them very much. It might be interesting to some people who are playing with crystal radios to try bias. It might be more useful when you're doing voltage doubling crystal radios to try biasing, because now you would be improving two diodes that are in series effectively, and that would get you a little more sensitivity. But I did want to show you what bias does to various types of detection diodes. Let's try an LED next. I checked it with the on my multimeter. Thing coming out at all without bias. Let's apply some bias. Oop. Okay, um, I'm full out. Okay, here's the problem with the LED. I don't have enough voltage. I now have a 6 volt battery instead of just a single cell. So the 6 volts is across the bias potentiometer. And we'll see what this does to the LED. Ooh. Hey, look at that. Okay. Typically you're putting, you know, 300 or 400 millivolts on the diode to get it going. How much voltage we need for this LED? Let's measure it. 1.56 volts. So the LED needed significantly more than the 400 or 500 that the germaniums and shot keys required. The uh, LED is working as a detector and it's pretty sensitive. An LED as a crystal radio detector, biased of course, unbiased, does not work at all. Biased, the red LED is doing the job. Okay, this is a normal crystal radio. I'm going to put the bias in. Remember, we didn't see much change when we we're talking about the regular germanium diode with bias. Party and run third party candidates in this uh, country, and uh, Musk has kind of um, reportedly bias in back a little bit is considering supporting a JD bias off for president in 2028. Bias in on the Ingram angle said the bias off some influence, but said my advice to you. So you can hear the difference with the biased germanium even, okay? 
even though it didn't show very much improvement on the meter, to your ear, it will sound louder with bias. So I just want to let you know we're not wasting our time here. This is a real improvement you can put into these crystal sets, whether, whatever diode you're using. At the risk of being burned at the stake, here's my take on the great AM detection schism. This controversy came from an affront to the foundational explanation of diode AM detection in your crystal set. The orthodox thinking was that crystal radios simply use envelope detection via half-wave rectification of the modulated waveform along with a filter of an appropriate RC time constant to follow the message or information we want to recover while rejecting any high-frequency components like the carrier and harmonics. This is all very straightforward. This settled, orthodox understanding of conventional half-wave rectification and envelope filtering was explained by Terman in the late 20s, early 30s. And this is our understanding of how crystal radios work and why getting a lower forward conduction point diode or adding bias really pays off for added sensitivity. But suddenly, in the early 2000s, some new thinking arrived, and it was quite radical. The premise was that detection was taking place not by rectification and envelope detection, but in fact it was by product detection. In other words, it was by square law detection the nonlinear junction of the diode was doing the work. This was actually the primary means of explaining how a crystal radio worked and not simple rectification and low-pass filtering. This heresy was justified by the discussions on low-level signals detected directly from the tank circuit of the crystal seem very low in amplitude. To be rectified with an envelope detector, how are you going to turn on that diode? And therefore, these are being demodulated at low levels using the diode's square law behavior alone, not by envelope detection. This method exploited the nonlinear characteristics of any square law device, like a diode, to extract the original modulating signal from the AM wave. The process involves squaring the input AM signal, then filtering out the high frequency components to recover the original message signal. So here's how it was explained. The AM signal containing both the carrier and the message frequencies is fed into a square law device. This device produces an output proportional to the square of the input voltage. The math is tedious, but the result is that with square law demodulation, you do in fact get a scaled version of the modulation out. Then you run this into your low pass filter and you're left with just two audio products. One is desired and one is undesired. As long as the modulation index is low, the second term, which causes distortion, is minimized. But as the modulation index of the modulation increases to 80 or 90 percent, this term causes significant distortion in the audio waveform. So a great online holy war ensued with fantastic amounts of math and opinions based on high science, good feelings, new information, exciting information. The detection heresy was spreading fast in the crystal radio community, and it continues to this day. Okay, okay, before we start a war here, um, I need to do some bench testing. Enough hand waving. Basically, I need to have a very low distortion AM signal that I can play into the crystal set. I need to be able to investigate the voltage on the diode, and we need to look at the distortion numbers before we can make a judgment. So stand by for part three, where we get into the square detection versus the envelope detection further, and we begin to go into the interesting subject of synchronous demodulation.